in the field what this looks like in reality, uh, this is what you and I would see if we walked up to it. We have the very same combustion air damper that we saw in the cutaway. We have the, the blower here that you can see on the right-hand side. The fuel passes in this scenario from the lower left upper to the upper right. It passes through, I'm sorry, lower right to the upper left. Let's try that. Through the butterfly control valve on its way to the burner. The control characteristic of the damper, meaning its angular opening as a function of flow, is not terribly linear, meaning that a 10% change in rotation on the force draft damper does not give us a 10% change in combustion air flow. And likewise, as you might expect from a butterfly valve, which is a round disc and a round pipe, as you change the position of that butterfly valve, you do not see incremental changes in volume with incremental changes in, uh, in stem position. So what we have to take care of that is our characterizable trim. Now you'll see this in many combustion applications of larger size. We have a modular motor, a Honeywell in this case, which is operating <laughs> based on steam pressure or water temperature in this case, going back to our combustion control side of this boiler. And there is a cam which has a mechanical contour to it. On the arm here, which is spring-loaded, there is a roller which follows that contour. And when the person is setting this burner up, they have their analyzer in the breaching. There's typically a hole there. The thermometer's removed. You stick your analyzer in there. You bring the analyzer out around to the front of the boiler and you literally adjust set screws in that cam which change the shape or contour in such a way that at any point in the boiler's firing rate we have that desirable mix of fuel and air. So at high fire we might be down in single digits of oxygen content. At low fire it might be low double digits. Again at low fire we have to provide a lot more excess air to combust all the fuel because we don't have as much forward momentum as much mechanical reaction in the chamber. But this is ultimately where the fuel air ratio is dictated on this particular boiler. Right. So, so just as an observation, um, you know, industrial facilities, boiler rooms aren't always the cleanest places no. in the world. When I look at all those those cams and shafts and springs and the other things you were describing, well, I see lots of potential for things to just not stay consistently the way you want yeah, Exactly to right. And as you can even see in the picture on the left-hand side, there is some uh, signs of oxide on, on the plate where that spring-loaded arm is. And, and really, by springs and mechanical force and friction, that's what keeps this whole system working. If someone were to step on this, use it as a step, which in our world we oftentimes see, you're going to start seeing things get bent. Uh, if the pivots are not lubricated, the fuel or ratio will not stay where you want it to be, where you set it. There's a lot of uh, potential for surface wear, rust, stiction, and those kinds of things. And bottom line is that all costs you money because it'll cost you're using warranty. Right. Exactly. Okay. Or it could cause a, uh, a safety issue. So, uh, there, although there are other means of getting around that, which today are predominantly linkageless solutions, this you'll see commonly in the field. And, and by linkageless, I mean we actually provide an electronic servo motor to go on the damper shaft for the uh, combustion air, and then there's another motorized servo which goes on the fuel control valve. Those two servos are electronically connected to a brain of many different forms that maintain the fuel air ratio precisely where you set it. So you get rid of all the mechanical aspects of the burner, and actually, uh, setup is actually uh, it's expedited. You don't need tools. You just use a color touch screen. You set it up that way. So that's okay. how it's done physically. All right, so as, as we move along, we've got about uh, 10 to 15 minutes left. We probably have another five or six minutes yeah, we'll keep uh, our presentation. So let's talk a little bit about analyzers, and then we'll get into safety and energy. Sounds good. Okay, so we've talked about the O2 values, CO2 values, and one would have to ask, well, how is this measured? If someone told me to measure an, off an inch, I'd, I'd really want to use a ruler. Here, when we're dealing with setting up large appliances of any type, uh, getting away from on the eye type of things for at least something more permanent in terms of setup, we use a, a combustion analyzer. And this is just a typical a schematic of how one of them works. We've got our flue gas stream on the left-hand side. In the case of a boiler, this would be the gases measured at the last pass of the boiler before they go up and out. We extract a sample 
at the probe. And as we learned in earlier slides, one of the byproducts of good combustion is moisture. So we take the moisture out of that sample. There might be some particulate involved, so we pass it through a filter. The P here in the, in the diamond is our pump. This really looks a lot like a very small uh, aquarium air sure. pump. We take that air through a small capillary, which controls our flow volume. We take some of the pulsation out with a small reservoir, and then we pass the sample through an oxygen cell, a carbon monoxide cell, and oxides of uh, nitrogen set of cells there, and sulfur dioxide if you want. All analyzers pretty much are unique in that you can purchase them with varying numbers of electrochemical cells based on what you wish to measure. Most people in the very simplest state just take O2 and CO and, and go from there. There's emissions analyzers, though, that have many cells for measuring other gases uh, of interest. So this is kind of what the inside of it looks like. We look at our combustion air temperature, and we look at our ambient. We get our uh, net temperature difference. And between net temperature and oxygen content, that's predominantly what's used to calculate the efficiency. Sorry, moved it. That's okay. Oh, yeah. It keeps us moving. So what we see here on this slide is a number of different analyzers. There's the old cocktail shaker set, which many uh, older folks in the crowd might remember. It's it's a chemical in a vial. You had to pump a sample through with a hand pump and, and, and bubble the sample through the liquid uh, volume changes which uh, told you how much CO2 and O2 you had. Today, of course, most people use an electronic version, uh, portable, battery operated, very small, quite a bit more durable than they, than they were even 20 years ago. There's some larger models that uh, have integral printers. Most of these portables use an infrared uh, coupling between a portable printer and, and the analyzer for documentation. And you know, here on the right-hand side is just an example of the printouts that it'll give you. So you can put your name, the date, any notes you have on there. And, and typically, I just tape those to a large sheet of paper and photocopy them and put them in my file. So I have some kind of a baseline for that application, that job site. I can come back to it and contrast it to uh, see how much things might have drifted over time. And not to be too obvious, we, we know where we can buy these, right? I mean, we know who sells yes, these. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll uh, help you there. We, we, we're going to kind of come full circle now. So we, we talked about combustion. We talked about uh, uh, analysis. And now we're going to talk a little bit about energy and safety. And again, if we've done our job right, it, what we've done so far should, should flow into this. So we're going to look at it. Um, Almost from a, a bigger picture, bigger picture sense. Hopefully, it's not a stretch. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, uh, what I would what I would set up the next three slides with, and folks, it's all we have left are our, our three slides for the presentation. We got a couple things after that, but just three slides here. Um, are two things. Again, if you're uh, if you're the user, uh, whether it's your commercial building or your process, and you want to know things or you want to hire somebody, these are going to be some really practical things. And this is what I think you should look for when you bring in a burner boiler specialist or a mechanical contractor. In addition to product recommendations they might give you, just some ideas that help you understand that they know what they're doing. Uh, and, and likewise, for the contractors out there in, in, in the audience, uh, it's good to have your users understand these things because it's a lot easier to be doing business with somebody who's got a better grasp on the situation. You can just have a conversation or a business discussion at a different kind of level. Right. So it serves it serves two purposes. So it, it's worth paying attention to these. Exactly. Yeah. And what we're looking at here is uh, some a very simple abbreviated list, of course, because we're really talking to a lot of different people with a lot of different types of equipment. But to some extent, you need to schedule tuning based on how that equipment's used. When I picture a small elementary school, I'm picturing a, a boiler, either steam or hot water. That boiler might fire uh, in October, and it might shut down in May. So we're dealing with just a few months of service. That is very different than, let's say, the paper mills that we have in Wisconsin, where boilers are fired hard and for long periods of time. So some of that mechanical wear, some of the attention required, is a function of uh, actual use time. So the longer it's used, the harder the service, the more frequent you should have someone in to take a look at it. As we learned before, the excess air is going to cost you in terms of efficiency, so we want to minimize that at the same time maintaining uh, clean uh, combustion, so that, that should be very important. Linkage list systems today, as we had shared in other slides, really help you to get around a lot of the mechanical stuff. So when your uh, service person leaves your facility, he left it or she left it the way it was desired, uh, and in how many months is that going to change because of 
issues beyond their control. So the uh, linkage list solution helps us to get around some of that. And obviously, any air that passes through the combustion process without passing through the flame envelope isn't doing us any good. So for those older boilers that might have been fired by coal at one time and they've been converted to gas or fuel oil firing, ash pit doors that are open that leak, that's all tramp air that passes through the boiler that robs heat from the process. We want to obviously uh, make sure that the setting is, is tight and that we have no more air in there than needed and that air is passing through the burner and not through other infiltration sources. 